Hey everyone, welcome to episode five of the Laser Cutter Build Series. Now, if you're new here for some reason, I'm doing a deep dive on building a CO2 laser cutter and engraving machine. And at the end of my project, I'll put together all my documentation so it can help you with your build. Now, last time we got started on the electronics and I got the movement side of things sorted out. Today, I wanna to get going on the laser side of things. But before I can connect the laser tube to the power supply and shoot laser beams across the garage, there's two systems I need to get in place first, and that's the water cooling and the air assist. So let's crack into those first. I'm gonna tackle the water cooling first as that one's gonna be the trickiest. Now I've messed around with quite a few different DIY systems over the years and this should hopefully be my best one yet. I'm basically replicating a CW3000 system which are extremely common and if you have access to one at a good price, maybe just buy that and be done with it. For me, living way out in New Zealand, the shipping costs make it really infeasible when I can make the equivalent, hopefully, for half the price. It should be noted that these systems use no refrigeration, just a radiator and fans, and they should keep the water around ambient temperature. Now this is fine for cooler climates and lower powered laser tubes, but if you live in hotter parts of the world or have a powerful laser tube you want to be running 24-7, you may need more active cooling. So these are my main components. We have the radiator, 12 volt fans, 24 volt power supply, 24 volt pump, flow sensor, a few plumbing fittings, some electrical bits, and the reservoir. I like this one because it's nice and square, though I would have preferred one that was tall rather than wide for space reasons. But I can see through it in case the water gets dirty, it's got a gasket seal to keep gunk out, and I believe it's also microwave safe, but that's not really important. Um, so this is going to be a little different depending on what kind of water reservoir people get, but basically instead of building it in CAD first, it's probably easier just to start playing with the parts and see where things fit. This is the arrangement I've come up with. It's gonna be a two tier kind of setup to keep everything nice and compact. We obviously have the reservoir and then my pump is gonna to mount to the bottom here. Then the flow sensor somewhere in here so that all my hoses are in the same area so there's no kinks or tight corners. The radiator and fans I will mount to the front side and the power supply on the other side. For an enclosure, let's just keep it simple with a plywood box, which means it's time to get on the tools. I've got some leftover 12 millimeter ply, so I will save some pennies and use that. I'm starting with the front because mounting of the radiator will give me my overall height and length dimensions for the other sides, and the width can be taken from the size of the reservoir. So I'm not gonna do anything fancy, just an unexciting but functional box here. I chose a radiator that could fit three fans just to give a good amount of cooling. My previous version used two fans and worked pretty well, though it did start to overheat a little in the summer, so maybe this will be slightly better. The downside, however, is because I wanna run this from a 24 volt power supply, I need a step down voltage converter for these 12 volt fans. With two fans, I was able to just run them in series to get my 24 volts, but with three, it's a, it's a little more tricky. So maybe an option for the future would be to run two radiators with two fans each, or maybe just one with four fans. Um, anyway, with the front face done, I can sort out the rest of the box. I need to make a cutout in the back to give access to the pump and the hoses and for airflow. So again, just eyeballing what's going to fit. Now I need a platform for the reservoir to sit on, so I'm placing a couple of strips either side that I can rest a panel on top of. I'm doing it like this so I can have access to the electronics by just lifting the reservoir out of the way. I'm then putting a corresponding cutout for the pump in the top panel as well. 
and then assembling everything with glues and screws except for the front face with the radiator which I'll just throw a couple of screws in at this stage so that I have access for mounting the electronics. While that's drying, let's get on to assembling the pump and the reservoir. I've used submersible pumps in the past, but I've always found the heat produced by the running of the pump actually made the water heat up faster, so that's why I go for external pumps. The intake of the pump doesn't have anything I can mount to for attaching it to the reservoir, so my cunning plan is to use these plumbing fittings over the top. But before I can fit it, I need to drill the threaded coupler out about a millimeter so that it fits snugly over the top of the intake. I'm locating the pump towards the corner of the plastic box, not only because of efficient layout reasons, but because it's the strongest part of the box to have a hanging weight attached to. Also, if you're not using a step drill bit for drilling plastics, then just pause this video right now, put, put down that cup of coffee and run down to the hardware store and get one. Absolute game changer. Anyway, now to stick it all together, I'm putting a bead of silicone around the intake so the coupler thingy can squeeze it down as I push it on and I'm softening the PVC with a heat gun so that it'll give me the absolute best fit possible. I used thread seal tape on the threads and I'm pretty sure I wrapped them in the wrong direction as I was trying to remember to wrap them in the direction of the threads. Ah oh well, it's still seated totally fine. And yeah, then a touch more silicone around the nuts just to make doubly sure there'd be no leaks. Before I install the electronics, I'm giving the box a couple of coats of polyurethane finish to keep everything in good condition. And once that's dry, I can reinstall the radiator. Oh, and before I forget, I got these little rubber feet to add some dampening and to keep it elevated. Okay, so the other parts to go in are the flow switch, the 24 volt power supply, the mains plug, and the little switch to turn the fans on and off. I got curious as to what was inside the flow switch, so I quickly took that apart for a look-see. Nothing too interesting, just a little spring-loaded gate. Oh, uh, getting distracted, sorry. Uh, the power supply has M3 mounting points on the back of the enclosure, so to lay them out, I'll use the masking tape template trick from before, and I'm mounting it up off the floor of the box so that if there's a leak, it's not gonna sit in water and get fried. For mounting the mains power socket, I then become a one-trick pony with the masking tape. Uh, I'm pretty sure just tracing around the outside would have worked as well. I then did the same for mounting the fan switch. With all the bits in the right place, I can start wiring them together. I'm using fork and spade terminals, which sounds like something I'd eat mashed potatoes with, uh, to crimp the leads between the main socket and the power supply. Then I can run the 24 volts out to the switch and into the fans. I've just got two of them hooked up in series while I wait for a step down converter so that I can run all three. Give them a quick test. Ooh, you know it'd be good, uh, using clear acrylic as the top panel so you could actually see the LEDs when they were running. Ooh, I'm totally gonna do that. So now plugging the water pump into the power supply as well. I thought about having a separate power switch for the pump, but then the pump always needs to be running when the laser's on, so maybe the less opportunity to turn it off, the better. I'm not gonna hook up the wires for the flow switch until I'm ready to do the final layout. Before I go any further, I should probably test that the pump actually pumps, otherwise I'm really gonna be under the pump this week. Sweet, so now I can finish up the rest of the plumbing. I'll use one of my old laser tubes to do the testing with for the next few weeks. It's just an old bog standard 50 watt that's served me very well. I also printed a couple of tube mounts for it as I couldn't find any bought parts that were nice and low profile. Okay, so here's the situation. A CO2 laser tube has an intake end and an outlet end, which also correspond to the high voltage and negative terminals. Cold water comes in to cool the high voltage side and then the warmed water is sent out on the negative end where the laser beam is emitted. I'm taking the outlet of my water cooler, which in my case is the pump, up to the inlet of the laser tube. Now the glass is pretty fragile so try not to force anything. Then the outlet of the laser tube goes down to the inlet of my radiator so that the water's cooled off. And then the outlet of the radiator flows back into the reservoir and that completes the circle of life. So yeah, let's turn it on and give it a quick test. I'm just using ultra distilled water from the supermarket and I'll put just enough in to cover the end of the hose for now. If you keep the hose submerged, that'll cut down on the amount of bubbles in the system, which are bad. 
Mm, so no leaks, though for peace of mind, I think I might get some more hose clamps. Before I install a proper thermometer for the water supply when I do the interface panel, I'll use a little aquarium one just to keep an eye on things. No bubbles in the supply, I'll call that a success, so now let's move on to the air assist. Now I won't actually be making use of it this episode, but it makes sense to look at it now while we're talking about things needed for the laser system. So I have an air compressor, some air hose, and the nozzle from the laser head. The air compressor is an electromagnetic air pump designed to produce high volume, low pressure air. I think it might only have one moving part and it is extremely efficient at what it does. But if you have other access to compressed air, by all means use that. To hook it up, I attach a coupling hose over the air outlet and stick an air hose into that. The air hose can then plug into the nozzle fitting on the laser head and I'll run the hose properly when I finalize the actual wiring runs. Now the reason we need this, and I probably should have said this at the beginning, is to blow air out of the nozzle so that it stops smoke from entering it and fouling the lens. And it also keeps the path clear for the laser beam to hit the material. I will talk about extraction in a future episode when we get there, but let's not get too bogged down because it is time to wire up the laser tube. Now this black box is an 80 watt power supply, and I suggest buying bigger than what you need initially so that you've got room to expand should you need more power. For what I do, which is a mix of engraving and cutting thin materials, 80 watts should be more than enough. Back over at our control board, the power supply needs three pins, a ground, signal and voltage control. These then pop into connectors over on the power supply, and I also need to jump the water flow protection switch as I haven't got that set up yet. I can then plug in the AC mains power, and then take the power supply power over to the laser tube's anode. Bearing in mind that I'm just doing this as a test, normally you want to insulate the heck out of the high voltage side of the power supply as it has an unfortunate tendency to send 20,000 odd volts of electrical arcing into nearby conductive surfaces. The cathode or negative side of the terminals can then be connected. Normally there's an ammeter in the loop here, but again I'm only doing low power testing for now so I'll address that in an upcoming episode. With everything connected up now, let's actually test this. So, controller on, pump on, power on, safety glasses on, 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 on. CO2 laser beams emit class 4 radiation and are so bright they're invisible to the human eye. Choose the best safety glasses you can find and do your own research because being blind is probably very inconvenient. Turning the power down to a safe level. And 3, 2, 1. So that's all we've got time for this week. Next time we'll start with aligning the laser beam, but until then you can catch me on Instagram or down in the comments. See you there.